Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's dark reading webinar, Securing Identities in the Cloud. It's sponsored by Radiant Logic and broadcast by Informa. I'm Becky Bracken with Dark Reading, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements, though, before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The doc of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and importantly, participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and you may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to provide feedback via the survey widget, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or you can just type the issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer you one-on-one -on -one assistance. With that, let's get on to our presentation, Securing Identities in the Cloud. Discussing today's topic is Jonathan Kerr. He's uh, an advisor with Lionfish Tech Advisors and Wade Ellery, who's Field Chief Technology Officer with Gradient Logic. If you'd like to learn more about our speakers, you can find their bios in the speaker bio widget on your screen. And again, if you wanna ask our speakers any questions, just use that Q&A area on the right side of your screen. With that, I'd like to hand things over to Jonathan. Jonathan? Hello, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, so, yeah, um, we're talking about identities in the cloud, and the old saying is, no one knows your A. And why is that? Because of uh, identity assertions have been fairly mutable. Um, and what we're going to talk about today, I think, is ways we can make identity assertions a little bit more robust and useful to us. So there's a couple of things, again, that we're going to talk about today. Um, first of all, um, an overview of the modern cloud attack surface. Secondly, how to implement IAM for users and devices. And thirdly, breaching on-premise through the cloud. Um, so. Uh, Without further ado, let's go into section one, which is an overview of the modern cloud attack surface. There are six areas for us to manage. And obviously today's webinar is all about identity. However, I think it would be wrong to hyper-focus on identity and ignore the other five areas of focus that we as security practitioners or security leaders need to be thinking about. And I've listed them here, email, identity, endpoint, internet of things, cloud itself, of course, and external, everything else. So let's look at email. Email remains this really major vector and focus area of defense. Why is it important? Because despite the training, people tend to trust an email is from who it purports to be. This is, in fact, partly an identity problem. It's also partly the fact that email was designed back in the days when Wade and I were young and uh, nobody thought you needed any kind of identification for email. Um, and it's, getting, it's quite a serious problem. So again, I've put up some stats here from a uh, threat center. Um, if an attacker successfully fishes, um, they usually get to private data within 72 minutes. That's not a long time for an instant response team to contain and eradicate. And we're seeing a 61% increase year on year on email, the volume of phishing attacks. Um, for those of you, uh, business email compromise cost $2.1 billion in 2021. It's a little difficult to get more current figures than that because, of course, many organizations are quite shy about reporting um, these sorts of figures. And attackers are also using legitimate resources to fish, for example, consent phishing. Uh, for those of you who use Facebook, um, you've probably seen these emails that pop up and announce saying, hey, um, click here if you ask for a password reset. And similarly for other consumer cloud services, um, 
these uh, attacks go on and on. And we can provide some safeguards here. So in our enterprise, we don't have to let an email through um, unchecked. We can check the URL. We can disable macros. And of course, we can engage in employee education. Um, and this is done through simulated phishing emails. And obviously, there is a variety of sentiments about phishing emails, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Is it trying to catch people out? Well, of course, that's what an attacker is doing. Um, but then we have to be sensitive to, obviously, the uh, emotional ten tenor of the workplace as well. And of course, continuously instructing employees on identifying malicious content that appears legit. Um, and there are a number of these. In fact, a, uh, a friend of mine is actually just publishing a book. Um, she's called it uh, Keanu Reeves is Not in Love with You, all about the murky world of romance scams. And again, there is a link here, of course, because um, we, if we have uh, employees who are falling for that, then we are putting ultimately corporate resources at risk. So let's look at identity. Um, well, we can expect to see in our organization uh, 921 attacks per second on average, which, again, from my friendly sock, is a 74% year-on-year increase of last year. Um, and surprise, or perhaps not surprise, 93% of cloud provider investigations revealed insufficient privilege access management and too much lateral movement. Um, both of these are like, well, gold for an attacker. Um, and they are, yeah, very frequent. It's also true to say that um, my friendly, uh, my friendly um, uh, web uh, yeah, uh, um, cloud provider security manager said to me that their biggest concern, the thing that really rings the five bar fire alarm is anything relating to identity which can be as simple as session token abuse, can even include endpoint compromise. We're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so, yeah, we're also seeing, and again, I had a um, conversation with a um, an architect from um, another security vendor who told me, well, if you put in MFA, then you're fine. That's all you need to do, and then your authentication problems is solved. And this is, frankly, not true. Um, there is something called adversary in the middle where they intercept and manipulate these tokens. And, of course, good old-fashioned token abuse. Many of these algorithms are becoming penetrated. And, of course, if you then have the, uh, the key material to generate the token, um, you stand a very good chance of being able to um, break into that. Um, also, third-party access accounts. It's not just your organization that is the target. You are part of an ecosystem. You have your suppliers. You have your customers. You have your partners. And for that matter, even your competitors. There's an ecosystem here. And high-privileged accounts in your suppliers are a great target for attackers. I know of one very well-known garment firm who got a very unusual email saying, hey, um, yeah, well, not unusual. We all know the story. Hey, can you please pay that invoice into our new account? Because, uh, well, for reasons. And they sent back an email saying, this looks like a fish scam. Have it, you know, did he really send this? And they replied, yes, we really did send that. Of course, what had happened was the account had been compromised. The attackers had taken control of it and were sending these messages, intercepting the authorization questions from the major garment manufacturing brand. Um, so that happens. And the other thing I think to note when we're thinking about the identity surface, it's more than just username, passwords. And in fact, um, I've got a thought on that, which I'm going to share with you shortly. Um, it also includes cloud access and workload identities. These are really critical credentials, which may be machine managed and machine utilized. They may have no users near them, but nevertheless, they are again like gold to an attacker. So here is a slide. And to be very sincere, if you remember nothing else of what I say, I really want you to remember this slide. Two things. 
if you are relying on passwords, nothing else, for anything internet connected, you're already breached. You just don't know it yet. And secondly, the identity landscape, the, the surface we're dealing with, will grow and expand. And so attacks on identity will grow correspondingly. They'll grow in volume and they'll also grow in variety. This is the new frontier. Um, talk a little bit about uh, hybrid environments and shadow IT because this is relevant. It's not just about endpoint, of course, everything is interconnected. Um, so on average, three and a half thousand connected devices in the enterprise are not protected by EDR, which is a large number. And you think about the consumerization of IT. You think about people using their personal devices. You think about just things that are brought in for a shadow project, you know, a, a quick marketing campaign or a quick sales campaign or needing to do some financial processing. And they rent some um, kit, bring it in, and of course, that is out, can be completely out of control of the IT team, out of visibility of the CIO and the CISO. Um, we see that $1.7 million is the median cost of a data breach from a mobile phishing attack. That's the median cost. It goes up from there and it goes, well, obviously it can go down, but nevertheless, this is real dollar amounts that hit the revenue line, that hit the P&L. And here's another question for you. You probably know all the uh, um, applications and resources you have. You know about your Amazon Web Buckets. You know about your Azure server resources. Uh, you know about your Salesforce instances. But are you aware what somebody may have plugged in? I mean, for example, uh, I use um, a calendar manager. Uh, allows people to schedule appointments with me. I use um, uh, some project management software that hit links into my Office 365 accounts. And um, of course, I've taken, you know, I believe I've taken steps to make sure they're secure, but I haven't really done a code audit. I don't really know. I'm taking it on faith that those are secure resources. And of course, the second question is, even if you've okayed those resources, what about the resources that then connect into those? You have a big blind spot here, which misses the endpoint entirely, which is this entire world of OAuth connected cloud applications. However, unmanaged devices and servers remain a critical threat to organizational security. And <clears throat> we need to seek continuous improvement of endpoint visibility. We need to be constantly looking, discovering endpoints, APIs, servers, to make sure that we can improve our security hygiene. IoT, the internet of Things are very, very broken, as somebody put it. Um, it's an overlooked attack vector. There are billions of devices. Um, they can include routers. They can include switches. They can include printer devices. They can include cameras. Um, uh, in, my, in my home here, I have all of those devices. I have smart speakers. I have a TV that's hooked up to uh, uh, the web and, indeed, um, you know, obviously a, a gaming device that hooks up to the web as well. All of these devices are threats, and that's just in my home. And you have similar kind of, again, smart TVs are found in the workplace and so on. Um, IDC, one of the big uh, data or bureaus, predicts that 41 billion IoT devices will be present within enterprise and consumer environments, which is a lot. Um, however, um, that does mean that this is a problem that every enterprise needs to pay attention to. Of course, the great thing about an IoT device, many of them at their heart are embedded Linux boxes. Many of those embedded Linux boxes are hard to patch. Many of them have vulnerabilities because they are hard to patch. And so they are a great foothold for an attacker they log in, they can get a shell access on that machine and, you know, the camera, whatever it may be, and they are uh, away into the internal network. And again, a study from one of the uh, 
cloud security providers said 35% of attackers reported an IoT device was used in the last two years to conduct a broader attack on their organization. So again, this is something we need to consider. So from an identity perspective, how do we prove the identity of a thing? And how strong does that need to be? So moving to the cloud, um, securing the cloud environment means SaaS, IIS, PaaS, distributed across multi-clouds and even, of course, extending back into on-premise. End-to-end visibility is a constant challenge. And with that lack of end-to-end -end visibility leading gives us that security gap. Ransomware is the, the, the nightmare, frankly, that seeks to leap into that security gap. And if you have a ransomware attack, again, 84% of organizations saying, hey, well, we didn't integrate our multi-cloud access with our security tooling because we had some cloud and it was only used for a tactical project, but oh yeah, we forgot to uh, decommission it. And this is the way that ransomware gets into an organization. Um, permissions. I still see, and I was talking with Wade, and uh, Wade, uh, Wade made me laugh. I said I had a developer who said I had this problem where I couldn't figure out the permissions, so I just set the Amazon uh, data bucket to world readable, world writable. And Wade said, "Oh, I must stop by and look at your results, because um, world readable and writable means anybody can." And of course, there we know there are crawlers, there are discovery tools that go looking for vulnerable web buckets with permissions oversights. And the other side of this is as we're putting more cloud as code into the cloud, I beg your pardon, we dramatically increase the risk of compromise. Of course, any complex system has bugs. Some of those bugs have a security impact. And that's been true forever, but now it's true for applications we're putting into the cloud as well. So again, our service has to extend to application. We can't focus on infrastructure protection only. And this goes on to, well, what are the what does the external attack surface look like? And um, again, 613 uh, cyber attack related compromise in 2021, more than more data compromise in 2020. It's been hard to get data more recent than that. Um, 53% of organizations say, hey, we had a data breach caused by a third party. Could be a cloud service provider, could be an application provider, could be a hosting provider. Um, attack services span multiple clouds, complex digital supply chains and digital ecosystems. Attackers will go where the money is. They will not say, hey, we'll just stick to this particular chunk because that's, you know, that's the one that uh, uh, belongs to us, which means the Internet is part of our network. The Internet becomes part of our connection chain. Therefore, it becomes part of the attack surface. And so if we're going to secure the external attack surface, we have to think about suppliers, partners, unmanaged devices, and newly acquired organizations. This is becoming a headache. There is an acquisition and you find, hey, this company has some security problems. So I'll move on now to how to implement IAM for users and devices. And, and again, a couple of questions. First of all, how do you implement IAM? Well, very simply, um, there are a number of solutions depending on your needs and preferences. Um, one thing I would highlight is that single sign-on, while it is a great um, simplifier for the user experience, it is a great convenience factor, it is not a security control. Although it does uh, route, um, help route back to a, a central authenticator, it does not in itself provide any inherent security. And if that can mask security problems, I have some uh, security researcher friends who are doing what they call SAML jacking, which is basically taking over a uh, single sign-on. Um, again, multi-factor authentication. Um, it can be a password, it can be a code, it can be a biometric or a device. Um, biometric is very interesting because, of course, there is some evidence to say that we can use behaviors such as 
typing cadence, such as mouse movements, as indicators. And the more of these factors we can put together, the more behaviors we can put together, the more we can combine device traits, the more we can combine these with perhaps traditional password or code-based authentication, then we strengthen that authentication process. Um, and of course, identity federation. I'm very keen on this because uh, you know, the idea of having multiple accounts on different uh, with different organizations becomes a drag if only because there's all those calendars you have to sync up um but if we can say we have a trust relationship especially between customer and supplier then we can again improve and simplify our IAM process and there's two other concepts um, which are moving into the authorization side. Role-based access control says we'll have a predefined role. So Jonathan Kerr is an engineer or Jonathan Kerr is a salesperson. And so we'll give them access to specific resources based on that role. Or there's also now a concept of attribute-based access control, which grants user access based on their attributes. So again, it's a little bit more granular and uh, is a little bit more flexible than you know some people have found our traditional RBAC to be. Next question, of course, is we know if we know how to do users, well, as I said, machines are people too. So how do we secure machines and devices? Um, well, first of all, we need to ensure device security policies. And this links back to some of the conversations that Wade and I had previously around zero trust. Uh, it links back to um, tools such as mobile device management or endpoint detection and response. So again, the endpoint matters in our IAM strategy because they help enforce policies. We can insist that data is encrypted. So if a device goes missing, and of course, remembering data can include session tokens. We can make sure those are not easily siphoned off by an attacker or somebody who's filching the, uh, uh, the, um, the physical device. And of course, device authentication. We need to authenticate the device. We need to know, yes, this really is Jonathan Care's phone. This really is Jonathan Care's laptop before we let it connect to the network, whether that be directly, whether that be through SASE or some other method. So again, a question, well, we're doing all this good stuff. We're, we're setting up what we believe to be best practices for user authentication, authorization, and for device as well. We need to monitor and we need to audit this. So we need to be watching and continuously checking for any anomalies, any threats, such as unauthorized access or data breaches. If you see somebody who is spelunking around the network, this is not cute. This is a security event that should be handled appropriately. And um, if you see this, again, it must be reported and documented. And obviously any findings provides an insight into compliance status, security incidents excessive lateral movement, perhaps, and again, recommendations for improvement. So we're starting to build that cycle of improvement here. And of course, we can use tools such as entity resolution analytics. We don't have to rely on an identity assertion. We can actually say, well, what can we figure out about the identity from our side? And of course, SIM, um, pretty much now, SIM, EDR, ERA, most to any kind of IAM, all these uh, systems now have some kind of user entity behavior analytics built in. And so I don't tend to talk about user entity behavior as a thing, because it's more a capability found in a wide variety of tool sets. But nevertheless, these tools can be used to monitor user device access, generate alerts, and of course, dashboards that help you understand the IAM uh, posture. So very quickly, I'd just like to touch on uh, breaching the on-premise environment through the cloud and say, how do we make it rain? Um, well, essentially, this is a transitive trust attack. So we're breaching a cloud-hosted IAM service, and we're looting credentials. And unfortunately, you do see there have been some IAM 
service providers. Uh, Okta have had a very bad time of it recently. They've had a number of publicly disclosed breaches, which allow attackers to do precisely this. Also, if you breach a cloud-hosted application that goes back to an on-premise data repository, perhaps some kind of legacy application, um, then you have you know, access to the crown jewels, the data that is in that legacy application, in that legacy data repository. And I've seen one, and if I wrote about this, um, one occasion where a software development company left their continuous integration, continuous development, automization, open to the world. Again, excess privilege. And, well, actually, you just get everything. You get secrets. You get source code. You get access to the builds as they're being produced. And so, yeah, you really do get the keys to the kingdom if you can get hold of any kind of source code. So, again, everything we do needs to be protected and access controlled. And I wanted to sort of wind up here with a, a few of what I call the uh, the cloud security sins. Um, unrestricted outbound access. When I first started doing firewalls around, oh gosh, nearly 30 years ago um, for Sun Microsystems, um, uh, great job. And one of the great things about it was it was okay to say anything going out from Sun, I could just let through. I didn't need to check it. The world has moved on. You can no longer do that. Um, again, improper public access, where you have the public accessing your services, whether they're consumers, whether they're potential customers, whether they're partners. Again, if you're not authenticating, authorizing, and monitoring that, then you have a, a cloud security sin of improper public access. Open databases, caches, and buckets. As they say, it's really not okay for your devs to say, I can't figure out the permissions. I'm just going to make it open to everybody. After all, who's going to know? Well, very quickly, everyone will know. And as Wade said, he'll be stopping by. Um, so <laughs> neglecting the cloud infrastructure as well. If you bring up a cloud, some cloud infrastructure, if you run applications, if it's just for a pilot project or some, again, short-term campaign, make sure you close it down. It's not just the costs of keeping that kit running in the cloud. It's the exposure you can have of any unmonitored, uncontrolled services. And again, monitoring and logging gaps. If you are missing visibility, then, you, then again, it will catch you out. And of course, finally, ineffective identity architecture. And I'm going to round off just by talking a little bit about that. If you don't root yourself in a single trusted identity provider that can enforce limited session times and support multiple MFAs, then you're in trouble. If you expose access keys, and oh my goodness, there are so many tools out there to pe let you check GitHub, let you check Stack Overflow, let you check all of the developer resources for exposed access keys and other nasties, then you're in trouble. Access keys should never be exposed. They should be something that is, again, granted on a per user basis. And frankly, you should be moving to tokens rather than fixed uh, access keys now. Uh, missing alerts. If you're not seeing and responding to alerts from your IAM system, you're missing a trick. You are failing. And of course, as I said, if you have accounts that operate in an excessive permission mode, if you have an account that says, well, I need to run as a DBA, but they don't really need to run as a DBA. All they're doing is running some software that accesses a database. Again, you've got a problem there. So I'm going to hand over at this point to my friend and colleague, Wade. And uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be here at the end. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, I do appreciate all the information you just conveyed. I'm going to do my best now to see if I can build on that and talk about how we can secure identities in the cloud and close some of the doors that you open. Right now, it's a little scary world out there. I'd rather call back into bed under my covers and not deal with all the threats, but I think we can give you a path forward. I want to ask a couple of rhetorical questions, though, about the cloud. Uh, first one, 
Can you tell me which is the cloud? Because in my perspective, the cloud is really just your data in someone else's building on someone else's server down the street. It's not an ethereal world where things operate differently. It is the exact same infrastructure, it's the exact same applications, it's the exact same processes that you're running internally. It just happens to be in a building you're not really allowed to go into on servers that you don't actually pay directly for. These are an Amazon data center and the NSA. If you can imagine one of the most public clouds and one of the most private uh, data center infra installations. I'll let you guess which is which, but again, the point, the cloud is really the same infrastructure you've always dealt with. But a bigger question right now is where are your users? Because we operated for a long time in a world where my users were inside my environment, where I had them in my building, behind my firewall, on my desktop using my systems, as you probably recognize the folks there on the right-hand side from the Office Space movie. But now I have people at home. The half my IT staff or my infrastructure or my teams may have distributed themselves around the world. This guy on the left here may be in Boise, Idaho, looking out over the lake in his backyard now while he enjoys his coffee and works on a Zoom call. My infrastructure has distributed itself around the world by my users taking it with them. So again, that idea of me being in control of the world I was in has shifted dramatically. And then the other question around the cloud is where are your applications? On the left there is my mainframe. All my applications were lived on this big box that was down in the basement with the water coolers on it that everybody knew was where IT happened. And now my applications happen to be hosted in someone else's data center that I don't even necessarily know where my Office 365 is held. Is it in the Oregon region? Is it in the Ohio region of AWS? It's not, it's in Azure. So my applications have also been scattered. And in scattering my applications, I've taken my identity data, which used to sit on the same server with my applications, and I've put that into silos of identity information now at each one of the multiple SaaS vendors that I'm using. ServiceNow has some of your identity data. Salesforce has some of your identity data. Azure certainly does. Okta certainly does. Any of the applications you're using out there in a cloud-hosted environment have information about your organization and access to your resources in their infrastructure. So I've really scattered this model dramatically. So what's the difference? Well, the difference comes down to control. On premise, it was your building. You could secure it. You could badge check everybody coming in the door. They had to go by Frank to make sure. And he recognized people by face as they came in. He knew everybody coming into the building. He brought him a cup of coffee if you were a nice person. But also, we owned the servers. We controlled the software. We installed everything. We patched everything. We had a potentially air-gapped world, or as Jonathan said, a firewall that maybe let all traffic outbound go out, but we didn't let things come in from the nasty outside world. And I controlled the workstation. I could wipe someone's image and re-image it overnight if I thought they put the wrong screensaver on their screen. I could push down virus scanning software. I could make sure my environment was, was locked down and was tight. And I controlled the applications. I built the applications. I knew how they were secured. I knew the infrastructure they were using. I knew the methods and models. I knew where the data was stored. I knew how it was encrypted. I had deep insight and understanding of my application platform that I don't necessarily have now. And I had firewalls and network segmentation to protect myself. I built a moat around my castle and I owned the data. The data sat on my hardware. I could go in and look at the data and the little red lights blinking on the front of my disk drives and know my information was sitting right there. But in the cloud, I've moved from I own to I trust. I trust that the cloud vendor I have has a good SOX 2 compliance process and he is remediating all issues he finds immediately and he has done background checks on all his employees and he's done all the things he needs to do to make sure that he offers physical security for my information. I trust his hardware to be reliable, to be reasonably good condition, to have backup. So when the power supply blows, that a backup power supply is already in line and I don't see any downtime. I'm expecting them to patch and update that hardware, make sure everything's running. I expect them to be able to have the resources in the environment so that when their staff is working, they're not inadvertently able to get access to my particular systems or my platform. And I'm trusting my applications are secured and updated and patched, encrypted, and well-written. 
again, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, in the cloud, we're assuming that someone else wrote good software, that they didn't just do features, they actually marketed high security and, and good protocols in the way they built their platform and stored their data. And that's an assumption where you're trusting again. And I'm trusting the network, the way they've segmented it, the way they're controlling it, the way they firewall the outside world. And I'm trusting the data management. Is my data commingled with someone else's? If it is in an Azure or an Okta environment, how is that information relatively separated? It's got to be done on some virtual layer. How, how impenetrable is that virtual layer? How easily could a bad operator migrate east to west across the data sets from some other compromised customer to my data? It's all a challenge that I need to consider. So cloud migration has its challenges. It's a great idea to have a cloud first mentality. You get to reduce the cost and overhead of maintaining a building and air conditioning and power and internet connectivity and server patching and all those things that are very non high level activities that we really don't like doing. And it sounds great on a, a revenue to cost spreadsheet to look at outsourcing all that information and the payoff that comes from that but it can also be problematic. Moving things to the cloud is not just a pick it up, put it in your pickup truck and drive it over to the new apartment. There's a lot of infrastructure that's tightly woven into your existing data environment that may not be compatible with the cloud. If I move applications that are not claims and SaaS and OIDC aware, then I need to move my authentication authorization and identity infrastructure with me into that cloud environment. What I'm going to end up, though, with over time is a hybrid model. I'm going to have a world where I live in both the cloud and I live on premise because it's unlikely unless you're a small startup that started in the cloud and went to all SaaS applications that you're ever going to completely get off of your on-premise environment. You're going to have to work in both worlds. But again, going back to that very first slide, don't think of the cloud as someplace different. Just think of it as an extension of your existing infrastructure. It happens to be managed by someone else. You're trusting they're doing it right, but all the tools and the things you've learned already still apply. Attacks still come from the edge. As Jonathan pointed out, that edge is where the bad operators are going to start nibbling at your environment. So you've got to be able to protect and monitor that. Attacks can move east and west. Once they get inside the environment, they are going to move across the environment. They're going to look for more highly privileged accounts. They're going to attempt to escalate their access. They're going to look for data by being able to move freely within the organization. So you lock that down as much as you can. Hackers are getting smarter. They're using better tools. It is a arms race. Every time we build a better defense, they build a better attack. They were using viruses before and putting viruses started getting stopped. They weren't able to move across the network. So they invented worms that could go out and crawl the network and, and infect other systems, even if you didn't carry around an infected floppy disk with you to spread it for them. Well, now we're doing ransomware where we've given up the idea of infecting the, the environment and causing a problem. We're putting in root kits and we're actually taking over environments and grabbing data and controlling the system and, and extracting cash now. I mean, viruses used to be an inconvenience, but it wasn't actually ransomware. Now we're actually being blackmailed into paying money to get our systems back. And is your data safe at rest? If I am compromised, is all my data encrypted? Is all my email encrypted? One recent uh, entertainment company a few years ago got compromised. The biggest things they lost was public trust because a lot of the internal emails that they had passed around about working with certain people in the industry and people they liked and people they didn't like and bad things they had said got made public. It was a very damaging process. That was simply email information, which we think is innocuous and not really of much security value. You need to be able to look at potentially securing everything. So in the new environment, in the cloud, the edge is much more porous. Again, remember my, my user is now in Idaho. He's on the local uh, Wi-Fi. He may be on his neighbor's Wi-Fi. I don't even know whether he's using a secured Wi-Fi connection or he's using some sort of cable TV back-end hop-on public network that he gets for free. But he's getting onto my network from the outside and he's bringing with him everybody that's behind him, everybody that can get on that channel, everybody that can compromise his access at his endpoint. So I have a lot more work to do to make sure that my edge is secure. And as Jonathan mentioned, Internet of Things, attacks can hop systems. Costco was hacked by an organization that first attacked 
the application on the HVA system that actually piped the temperature and settings back to a central knock for the HVAC air conditioning system, they hopped off of that network onto the primary network and were able to then again move east and west. PAM is not enough. You can't rely on just securing privileged accounts. There are so many accounts there that have elevated privileges that may not qualify as a privileged account and may not be checking out their credentials that may be over provisioned right now. So you really need to be able to lock things down. And there's hackers for hires and franchises. The casinos that were recently compromised in Las Vegas, that was done as a franchise operation. Someone rented the tools from another hacking organization to go out and see if they could, they could be successful in their attack. And they were. So the amount of uh, attacks out there are coming from so many different directions. When's the last time you, you clicked on a link in an email? We send out phishing emails in our organizations now ourselves to try and train people not to do that. And there's still a high percentage of people that go, oh, look, my bank says there's something wrong. I should check on this. It's a trap, but we fall into that trap regularly. It's almost like the slasher movies where the, the young teenager is walking across the room on the phone talking to their friend about how the lights just went out in the house and the bad guys behind them threatening them in that moment, we don't see it coming because we're just not living in that world enough. And they're gonna go after identity and proprietary data first. As Jonathan mentioned, if it's a data breach, that's what the NOC and the folks in the organization get most excited. That's where the value is. As Willie Sutton said, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Why do you go after identity data? That's where the power is. That's where the control is. That's where the access is. If I can lock down the identities, I can compromise the identities, I run the network. As you can tell again with the casino hack, they were actually grabbing credentials off the wire on certain systems and able to elevate their privileges very dramatically. So given all that I've just scared you with in that terrible world out there, how do you operate in this kind of environment? And how do you operate in a world where I've now built a hybrid cloud environment that threw open those doors to a lot more threats and a lot more compromises out there. Well, I understand the architecture of the way things work. I have all of my operating systems in my platforms, my access management, my customer identity and, and information systems, my IGA platforms, my privileged account management, even my software defined perimeters and legacy applications, all these need identity information to do their job. And that identity data is now scattered throughout the world. It's not just scattered throughout my organization, but it's out in other vendors' platforms, it's in hosted HR platforms, it's everywhere. And if I simply write connections and try and do this on a one-to-one -one basis, I'm creating a very difficult to support platform, but I'm also creating a lot more vulnerabilities to my system. And I'm creating a lot of overhead that causes my internal resources to actually go and do their own uh, version of cloud IT or shadow IT where they go and, and implement a platform themselves because for me to deal with the spaghetti, I put so much load on my IT infrastructure that it's very difficult for me to respond to business needs. So what I need to look at doing is actually, again, building out the infrastructure, recognizing that information is now everywhere. I need to be able to understand everybody that needs that data and then layer in an identity data fabric that moves the data from all of my sources, manages it, controls it, provides analysis and, and uh, can, uh, restraint and management on that data and then delivers it to all the different sources that need that data across all the different products in the implementation that need that information to operate. And those may be on-premise, those may be cloud-based applications, because again, we're in a hybrid world. So what Radiant Logic is doing is this function here in the middle, the identity data fabric to say, if identity is the key, if it's the last perimeter, if it's the thing that I can control, it's the way I make sure my environment is safe, everybody needs a piece of it. It comes from all these places. I have to have a control plane. I have to have a identity data bus in between to manage and control and deliver this information so that my identity fabric, all these consuming applications, get what they need to do their job. And this applies across the zero trust infrastructure. If you look at all the different pieces of the infrastructure, and, and Jonathan went through basically the exposure here, it's not just as we consider classic identity application access, but it's endpoint access, it's data access to databases and data resources, it's infrastructure, it's microservices in my application east-west traffic, it's my network access, 
all these additional vendors are controlling and gating and securing these different components for you in the zero trust architecture, they all need a policy information point. They all need data to make those decisions to allow that access. That policy information point, again, comes from all the information in my infrastructure, all the information coming from my endpoints, my applications, my provisioning, my data, all the cloud resources that I can pull together. And it needs to be presented in a manner that's easily consumable on a policy information point. That's where Radiant Logic sits. Again, this aggregation isn't just throwing everything into a bucket and making soup. It is actually correlating and integrating and mapping and translating and transforming and modeling the data so that each of these policy engines in the zero trust architecture or in my identity data fabric gets exactly what it needs to be able to do the work it does. Now that's wonderful. I have the identity data that I need to make the decisions that I need to make. I'm okay, I'm ready to go, right? Well, yes, but you also want to layer in risk and quality controls because data is constantly changing. Data quality is questionable. There's a lot of IT debt in the organization. Can you trust the data? Is it complete? So we add in a layer of identity analytics to that data to allow you to put in controls and understand risk, apply data science and uh, anomaly detection and peer group measurements and functions within an AI machine learning world where I can make this data more reliable, more actionable, better information to make decisions on, and then I remediate that data. I improve its quality and run it through the cycle again. It's an infinity loop of continuously polishing my information so it gets stronger and better at making the decisions of providing the access that I need. This identity data fabric built on top of an identity data lake with architectures of infrastructure, uh, directories, identity data in a graph model and time series recording so I can move forward and back in time. I can compare what used to be to what is. All this plays into this particular infrastructure that allows you to control identity at a level that you need if you're gonna be operating in a hybrid cloud model. So I have all my sources coming in, I have all my data engineering going on in the middle with the Radiant Logic, and I have all the consuming clients. These consuming clients are not identical. They do things differently. They look for different information. They're servicing different parts of the environment. My software-defined perimeter is doing different information than my database access management layer, but it's the same people. It's the same information presented in a way that makes sense and is usable. So what am I doing? I'm rebuilding this access change. I'm going back in now and understanding how access is needed within the organization, within jobs, within responsibilities. I'm tying that back to identities. I'm extending that out with accounts and groups so I know how this access is being granted. I'm going all the way down to permissions so I know what's inside an application, how someone's getting access to that data. And then I'm logging and auditing this information in a way that allows me to look at usage and tie that back into the identity and access change. And the value here is I'm creating a multi-dimensional model. I mentioned earlier a data lake and the idea of a graph database. This is a multi-dimensional relationship model that we're building within the platform that allows this identity information to work in a much more robust, much broader context that's necessary if you're gonna secure your cloud environment. I have to be able to understand not only the object, the user, the machine, the bot, the service account, but I have to understand the attributes relative to that in order to be able to do granular access control, which I need to do to secure my environment. But I also need to understand the relationships of that object to all the other objects in the organization. Who owns that particular account? Who owns that particular application? What entitlement is granted by what group and what context and what organization within the, or the actual overall environment itself? All this is woven together in a multidimensional model. So again, there's a lot of uh, complexity potentially in trying to do this unless you have a platform that's engineered and built for this very purpose. And this is exactly what Radiant Logic is doing. We're not just providing the identity data, we're providing with a life cycle to continually analyze, apply AI and machine learning capabilities to that data, enrich the information, be able to make this more actionable data and then remediate the IT debt in your environment because you're now gonna start making decisions about access to resources 
inside and outside your environment based on attributes and based on policies. You have to get down to a level of granularity at that level. You can't do role-based access in an open cloud environment because there's too much inherent access in that account. When that password is compromised, when that two-factor authentication is hijacked, the access that account now inherently has makes it very, very dangerous. Moving to a zero trust architecture says, I'm gonna take away that provisioned access. I'm gonna authorize the user in the moment that he needs to access a resource. And in doing that, I'm gonna make this platform much more secure because I don't have accounts laying around with large amounts of access that can compromise my environment. I don't have access to resources that is simply granted by taking over someone's account. And in that way, I have put another layer of security around my infrastructure, around my data, around my identities themselves. But key to doing this is having the ability to recognize all of that information. Sorry. That was the end of my 20 minutes. Um, so I'll hop it up here a little, a little quicker and get to the very end of my show. But basically, we're moving this through a identity information pipeline to make that data actionable. It's identity check, detect, migrate, and recommend. Again, a cycle of improvement constantly in the system from all the sources of information to all the endpoints that need to consume it and applying all those policies with a time tracking model here so I can not only understand what things look like today and authorize on data that's available in the moment, but I can track the change of that data. I can see progress in my cleanup. I can see increases in my security risk. I can put risk scoring around my information. I can do account review and attestation based on, show me everything that's changed in the last three months since my last review. Don't make me review things that I reviewed before that are exactly the same as they were before unless there's a reason for me to go through that process. And machine identity governance, Again, going back and looking at the concept that machines have identity too. I think this is almost where Jonathan started with the dog. Um, the dog can also be a machine on the internet. Nobody knows you're a machine. So what am I doing here? I'm actually applying controls and analytics and reports and visibility and monitoring on this data. So when something goes left, I can see that immediately. I can act on that because when I'm controlling my access to the cloud, when I'm integrating a hybrid world, what I have left to manage now is my identity information. That's the challenge that I have. I've got such a distributed model that I've lost my original perimeter, my simple castle moat. Now I have to be able to operate in a more distributed model. That means I have to grab control of identity. And this is where you're gonna see that kind of capability is being able to do that in the Radiant Logic platform. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone and return to Becky. I think there's questions that we have queued up that we want to address before we end our... Uh... We certainly do, Wade. And I want to thank you both, uh, Wade and Jonathan, for those insights. Um, and before we get to the q and A, I I just want to direct everybody's attention once again to the webinar survey form. Um, we'd appreciate if you would fill that out before leaving us today. So our first question is from Chris, and Chris wants to know, how does Radiant Logic consume data from all those sources? How would it know if any sources are missing? Which is a great question. Wade, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah, I'd love to. And basically what's really nice about the world we're working in, what makes a lot of this more possible, and John touched on it lower, earlier with OIDC, we're moving towards a standards-based platform. So. Radiant Logic is standards based and platform agnostic. We'll talk to anybody that uses a standard protocol. Now that may be an LDAP, it may be REST, it may be SKIM, but it also may be a database backend. It may be a flat file. It may be any documented web service or API. So if the data is exposed in any way on that endpoint and we can identify that information, then we can connect to it and we can bring that data in. There are tools within the product once that data is, is brought in that understand that a flat file format is much different than an LDAP or a SKIM interface data set. So we can transform and translate that so they can be joined and mated together. And part of the analytics in that continuous process is to look at the 
unified model you've built and find the gaps, find the holes. Did I not bring in organizational information? Do I not know who manages who? Because I didn't get that information out of my HR platform feed. Where can I see gaps in my logical model? And then it is also an iterative process. Over time, I'm gonna add additional sources to the system. You don't wanna start out with boiling the ocean. You wanna bring in the platforms that are obvious that are gonna have the biggest impact and incrementally add more systems to that. As far as knowing what's missing, part of that is having to go back to the business and, and trying to understand more how they do what they do, which can be a challenging part of the process. They don't always know how the magic happens. So we have to help them understand how that information flows into the platform. Excellent. Now I have another question. I think this one would be great for Jonathan. Jonathan, I'd like uh, maybe for us to unpack a little bit the distinction between securing identities in the cloud versus on-prem and even hybrid environments. Can you can you give us a little bit of insight on that, Jonathan? Sure. Um, and in fact, I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit contrarian here because uh, in a ideal world, or in fact, in a well security managed world, there should be no difference. Um, the cloud identity and the on-premise identity should have a seamless merge. In fact, one of the things that worries me is when I hear about, um, oh, we've got our cloud security operations team and our on-premise security operations team, and those folks they don't really talk very much. They don't really uh, have much to uh, have much to say. Um, so, cloud should not make a difference. We are seeing now that a lot of IAM pro uh, providers are, you know, cloud native. They are um, operating from it. They're, they're, they're operating from the cloud, or as uh, Wade said, somebody else's data center. Um, they are so that we're we're moving away from the idea where we'd have um, an IAM infrastructure. Um, if you like, inside our data center and then reaching out to the cloud. It's actually in reverse. We'll have something which is primarily hosted in the cloud and then is providing IAM as a service and linking back to any on-premise directory service and so on. Um, so uh, I think the, the difference that the cloud makes is in the same way that we expect um, our cloud applications and data bases, data repositories to scale on demand. We expect the same for our IAM service. We expect it to scale with the needs of the business. We don't expect that that's something that's going to be complex or difficult. Um, as the business grows, as the, as the demands grow or shrink, then we expect the IAM service to scale with that. Excellent. Thank you so much for that explanation. Unfortunately, we have reached the top of the hour. Any questions that we didn't have a chance to get to today will be presented to Wade and Jonathan, and they can respond to you offline. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, again, Radiant Logic, as well as everyone in our audience. We very much appreciate your attention and your participation. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who might not have been able to uh, listen to the live event. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Radiant Logic, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of our guest, Radiant Logic, I'm Becky Bracken. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great day, and we will see you at a future Dark Reading event. Thank you all.